It gives me great pleasure to uh, welcome uh, Peter Swartzel back here again to uh, do a presentation. His uh, presentations are legendary and uh, uh, you get more... Legendary? <laughs> oh, you, get, okay. you get more information tonight than you, you, that you'll get from reading a hundred books on uh, sailing books. So uh, it's, uh, it's great to have you here and, uh, and I understand that Peter Baker is going to film this um, presentation tonight for... Uh, for, um, for what? For being, for well done, well done, Warder. Well done, Warder. Yeah. Yeah. Dot TV. Yeah. So, so Peter, thank you for coming, and, and I know you, um, you will have spent hours uh, preparing this, and uh, we, we thank you. We're grateful. As always, okay. You know, for your time. Would you like to hand out some paper clips to everybody? Yeah. Great. You'll need a paper clip later, so just keep a paper clip in your just pocket. One each or? Oh, there's how many are here? About thirty and. What's there, 50, 100 in the, 100 so that you can be generous. Generous, okay. Yeah. Very technical. So, um, thanks Bruce and thanks everybody for coming. And um, feel free to shuffle forward down close so I don't have to talk so loud. And um, this is a, Who's familiar with the G4 and, the, and it falling over? Is everybody here familiar with that? Well, you can buy it in a couple of months' time if you want. Yeah. It's for sale. It's got a big for sale sign on it. In a month's time, in America. And uh, gunboat are in receivership, so that's a bit sad. Chapter 11. They're coming out of it. So, um, the G4 is a really high-tech boat, mainly carbon fibre, which is the word of the decade. And... Um, Uh, we'll be coming back to some testing on uh, the G4 later on. So the tonight's talks on yachting materials, and they're really it's really a boring subject. So I need to sort of make it a bit interesting. So there's a few things um, here to hand out and have a look at. So everybody get a paper clip and think about that. And there's a few things in the box here just to pass around and have a look. This is um, a 3D piece of 3D eye sail off of uh, Blackjack, who I heard the name mentioned before. 3DI sails are the sort of the big thing at the moment. And there's a few pieces of stuff in there just to have a look at. And if anybody wants to get up and wander around and look at the table, please do. Uh, there's stuff here that I might talk about as well. Because um, tonight I want sort of to be more of a question and answer than a sort of affair than a lecture. Um, lectures are really boring, I found, so when I was at uni, so. Please, what, what, uh, well, so I'll continue on. So does anybody know what boat this is? Did anybody watch Gilligan Island? Are we from, the, are we from that period? So we're all from that period. So um, Gilligan's Island was uh, released in um, 1964. And the 60s were a time, we don't have sound, okay. So in the, in the 60s, all the, all the high-tech materials we have today come from the 60s, come from the space race. So to make it a little bit more interesting, I'm going to use um, America's Cup, Gilligan's Island and carbon fibre to sort of put a frame around these materials in time and in space because the space race that got us all of the materials, Dyneema, carbon fibre, fiberglass, uh, even the aluminium that bike frame made from, all those come from the space race. Sorry, Peter, can we yeah? down here? Kill that volume. Uh, I'll kill it. Sorry? Kill the volume. Yep. Done. Oh, much better? Sorry, so I'll go back here somewhere. So, um, yeah, basic materials are really boring and we're going to sort of talk about from the 1960s up to now. Nothing much has changed, but what's happened is all these, all these technologies have matured. So in 1962, the America's Cup Challenge was an Australian. It was, this boat, it was a 12 metre boat, it was designed by Alan Payne and it was a steel boat. It was a steel frame boat with timber, timber hull and deck. It was the last timber boat made for the America's Cup. So in 1962 we decided to go to the moon and steel and timber was what we were building nearly everything from and we didn't 
couldn't get to the moon with steel and timber. So suddenly we got aluminium, titanium, all those things started coming online. Composites came online in um, really high tech stuff and boat builders really didn't get wind of carbon fibre probably 10 years later than, than the 60s. So all the stuff we're going to talk about, we think it's sort of new but it's kind of been around for 60 years. So today's helpers are the, uh, the uh, <laughs> actors from Gilligan's Island and uh, Ginger, Ginger and uh, Mary Ann. Uh, they help us out a bit. So that was in 1964 and they were trying to get off an island and they, there was a lot of uh, various things about space. They had people, they had aliens land and robots land and all sorts of stuff. So that was an interesting thing. So I'm going to use these people to be, add a little bit of interest to the materials. So tonight's topics are traditional materials, metals, structural fibres, rigging fibres, resins, sale materials, processes, testing and then question time. But to chop that up a bit, each section takes about five minutes and I'll just have a short question time after each bit. And so I like to try and keep it as question and answers. Um, otherwise, and I'm going to cover a lot of territory really fast because it's, you can talk for um, 10 hours on fibres. So starting at traditional materials, timber, manila, cotton and tar. We were in 1960s, we're still building boats using timber, manila, manila cotton and tar. So um, when I was a kid, I played tournament tennis and I used uh, timber rackets glued together with resource and oil and animal glues and cat gut and they were terrible. They changed shape, changed tension, all that sort of stuff. So the Howells were really familiar with that sort of stuff. And in 1851, when the America's Cup was first won, the 100 Guineas Cup, the boat was made of timber. But there were two factors in its success. That was cotton sales, American cotton sales. First time cotton was used for sales. And it wasn't a cod head design. Do we have any boat builders here? Does anybody know what a cod head design is? Hull, a cod head hull? Up until about th that period, yes, the, the maximum beam was about, th they thought the, the fast boat had maximum beam at 30% of the hull length. And Americans got really keen on tank testing and figured out that actually a boat's faster with at 50, maximum beam at 50% of the boat length. And so it had those two factors and it won lots of races and became a very famous boat. So do we have any questions about traditional materials? Because I'm sure you don't want to know about plywood and timber and stuff. So there's no questions, so we move along. Uh, so what happened was we did a lot of stuff with metals uh, and to knock out two of them, mild steel and magnesium, because in a, on a yacht they corrode really fast. If you do something in mild steel it rapidly ends up like this balustrade. Am I in the way there from you guys? No, it's alright. Um, and same with magnesium, if you just look, get a magnesium alloy and get anywhere near salt water it'll disappear right in front of your eyes. So those two were knocked out, but they, they were pretty much highly developed for um, applications and mild steel hasn't changed much and magnesium's because of corrosion hasn't been used much at all. So our three majors in the, uh, do we have any lead keelers here? No, oh, that's good. Used to have one. Used to have one with a lead keel. So um, all of these materials, stainless steel, aluminium, titanium and lead or in mild steel, any of the pure metals, iron, pure titanium, pure aluminium are very weak and we use a thing called a hardener in them to harden them. So for instance in stainless steel we use uh, carbon and chrome and nickel are the hardeners and then we from that combination you can get thousands of different types of stainless steel. If you've got an aluminium saucepan at home that's really soft and you can move it around that's because it's nearly pure aluminium. If you add silicon, magnesium or uh, manganese to it in various proportions, it hardens it and makes it really strong and you can get very strong aluminium alloys and zinc is another hardening agent. And uh, titanium is similar, we use aluminium and zirconium, or actually aluminium and uh, vanadium to harden titanium. And that's a really nice material to use. Brass and bronze don't use much anymore and I shouldn't mention it after Jim jumped in about some bronze. <laughs> 
And get, just getting back to lead, pure lead's really soft, and if you want to use it on a boat, especially underwater, it, it can disappear with salt water really quickly. And um, we add antimony to it, and that, that makes it about four times stronger than pure lead, and you can put threads in it, it passivates the surface, and it doesn't disappear in salt water. So with all these talks, I try to give sailors some sort of information that's not readily available. And I suppose that there's three things with metals that are interesting to me and other people is corrosion, fatigue, and I've talked about hardening. So if we talk about corrosion, um, there are two types of corrosion in metals. There's what's called coupled and uncoupled. So steel rusting is uncoupled. So when oxygen combines with carbon, it actually separates from the surface and it, it just flakes away and it disappears like this balustrade. With stainless steel, aluminium, titanium, it's a coupled corrosion. So if you clean it really carefully, and then when oxygen combines with it, it stays connected to the metal, and it forms a ceramic, which is very passive and very uh, resistant to the marine environment. So they're the, that's, that's the main reason that aluminium, titanium, and stainless steel are passive in a marine environment, because they have an oxide layer on, this, on the surface. The other thing is metal fatigue. Um, who, who, does, who, who hasn't heard of metal fatigue? Uh, no, but can, can I ask a question before you move off that? Absolutely. Um, I was amazed to find that uh, on my boat um, it, it actually has cast iron rudder bearings. And uh, the last time I did a, uh, a, a renovation on it, I, I wanted to throw them away and put something more modern on And, and uh, I was told, no, don't throw them away, they last forever. Yep. And that's because un underwater, a certain height underwater, there is no oxygen. They're not in the water. They're oh, they're above the water. They're, they're oh, okay. But, um, so it's cast iron running on what? Stainless steel, or is there no, a bronze line? Bronze to timber. Oh, bronze to timber. Okay. They're, they're, um, they're couplings which hold the, the, the rudder shaft in the boat. Okay. Um, not sure what happens with. I think is it, are they rusty or were they painted? They're, they're rusty, yeah. Yeah. And they're a little bit fitted, but uh, you know, I was told don't throw them away. They last forever. Okay. Well, there's a big yellow block of nylon over there. That's a oil impregnated plastic nylon, and that's sort of typical of what you can use these days. I don't really like nylon because it um, shrinks and grows when it absorbs water. Um, but that's sort of the thing you would have perhaps used to replace it with. Tea staining is from um, usually the presence of carbon. If you use a nitric acid or a phosphoric acid or a hydrofluoric acid cleaner, clean it really well, rinse it really well, and then just let the air oxidise it. It'll go away. The tea, the, the, that's rust, and that means that the oxide layer is being broken down, and that's usually from another metal washing onto it. So there's some metal somewhere or whoever welded it, and they might have ground it with a, with a grinding wheel and then didn't clean it. Uh, they can, there could be something zinc higher up and when the water washes down it gets zinc on it. It's a whole bunch of contaminants, but something is removing the oxide layer, allowing it to rust. Yeah, I thought um, they're uh, rods. There. Rods. There. Yeah. Oh, handrails. So yeah, if you get some um, um, phosphoric acids, the kindliness, kyn which is sort of Coca-Cola, but um, then you go up to nitric acid, which will do it really fast. Uh, then you're up to hydro hydrofluoric acid, which does it really fast, really nice, but it's a really nasty acid. Pool chlorine What about pool acid? Yeah, pool acid, hydrochloric acid, muriatic acid works as well. Not as, it's not quite as good as nitric. And then I'd polish them after that again. No, no need to. If you want it polished, you mechanically polish it, which will take rid of the tea stain. Polish it to the level you want polished, then passivate it, then clean it with the acid. Because once you clean it with the acid, you've got to leave it, so you can't... If you muck with it, you'll just get, get back to where you... Well, passivating means you wash it in acid, then you leave it to air, and it returns it the oxide layer. And making sure it's a marine grade stainless to start with. Is very, very there, uh, yeah, it should be, yeah. So they're usually what's called 304 or 316 is the balustrading type stuff. 
Um, and um, so, yeah, that's typically called passivating the surface of stainless steel. And it's the same with um, um, aluminium. You can clean and, and let... The problem if you clean aluminium, in, you can get uncoupled um, uh, corrosion with aluminium. It gets white powder. So uh, things tend to be anodized, which is a controlled corrosion. Um, and uh, titanium, anybody got titanium on their boat? No? No? Okay. You don't want it? It's great stuff. Can't it. Oh, I can't afford it. Oh, you should be able to do it because there's so much titanium on the planet because everybody's going to composites now. I've been trying to find a good titanium supplier. Now, where are we? Ah, fatigue. Okay, metal fatigue. Um, Everybody's familiar with cracks in metals and fatigue. Uh, the usual scenario is the way we think about fatigue is that um, we make something really good and we put it into service and at some point it cracks. Is that what most people think fatigue is? Does anybody disagree with that statement? Okay, good. So you're going to learn something tonight. Metals are made up of little grains and there's more nothing in a piece of metal than there is something. All the grains are like grains of metal are like grains of sand all pressed together, and this this image up the top right shows all the gr little grains and edges, and they're all held together by friction. So if you get your paper clip and um, and you uh, straighten it out, and then bend it up again, and then really flex it nice and hard, but don't break it. Oh, it doesn't matter. But then feel it. You'll feel it's warm. That's all the little grains rubbing together and creating heat. And that's what, that's what fatigue is. So when, when the metal flexes, all those grain boundaries are rubbing together and they're failing and the, all the cracks are starting to connect together like that one up there. They all start at like thousandths of a millimetre small and they all slowly grow and, and come together to a crack that could lead to a ca catastrophic failure. So fatigue cracks are actually cracks that are there from day dot. You can't see them. We can look at them under a microscope and they slowly grow. I'll talk a little bit more about that with welding later. So they had um, um, like a spaceship drop on Gilligan's Island and they didn't pull a panel off and stick it on their boat. No, I'm not sure why they didn't pull it apart and fix their boat, but um, they had all sorts of things happening uh, on the island. Any more questions about metals? So structural fibres. Um, do, we, do we have anybody wearing rayon tonight? Any, anybody wearing... Rayon's an old-fashioned sort of material, but it's a natural fibre made from cellulose. And rayon was the first fibre that we converted into carbon fibre, structural carbon fibre. So uh, the, the, this sort of clothing that were worn in the 60s were probably rayon. And um, Union Carbide and the Japanese were madly uh, making carbon fibre out of this sort of uh, material. And it sort of looks like that eventually. So this piece, this is about um, 30 years old. This is the first piece of carbon fibre I, I ever got hold of. And um, it came from, came from um, Japan somewhere on a project. So if we go through the, the typical fibres, we've got e-glass. Oh, does anybody know what e, e stands for in e-glass? No. <laughs> e-glass is the cheapest thing on the planet. Okay, I'll explain that. So, um, does anybody have Pyrex at home? Yeah. Pyrex is e-glass. So, same thing. Um, so, where will I start? I'll start with e-glass. So, e-glass, e all the glasses are made from sand. So, somebody gets a big scoop of sand, chucks it in a reactor, heats it up, falls through a hole in the bottom, just like a spider web is made. It starts at quite a big... Uh, piece and if you've watched, ever watched a stream of water from a tap it gets starts big and it gets thinner and thinner and thinner that's what happens with the glass and at some point being it's in air it gets cool and it gels and at that point you grab it and you put on a reel like this and and, and uh, this is um, how many toes is that I forget this is Six thousand. Okay, that's six k toe. So that means there's six thousand fibres on there, and uh, so they had it come from six thousand holes. There were six thousand holes in the reactor, and they all fell in space. Uh, if it was glass, not carbon, 
uh, and then they grabbed it at some point when it set and um, rolled it up and, and it looked like that except it's clear. That all happened in the late 50s and they were making fiberglass for insulation and in the early 60s they started making printed circuit boards for space craft and they were using Bakelite and Bakelite failed at that job miserably. And at some point somebody said if we get some e-glass and um, epoxy resin and put in a press and make some fiberglass plates that will be perfect for PCB boards and we've been using exactly that forever uh, right to this date. This computer probably has a uh, fiberglass PCB board in it. Some, and so uh, once it got to that stage um, Dow Corning made a special glass just for uh, P oh, printed circuit boards, sorry, printed circuit boards and um, they made a special glass just for printed circuit boards and they called it electrical glass and that's where the E comes from. So E glass means electrical glass. And then about 10 years after that in the mid 60s they said oh this is really good stuff um, we need it to be stri stronger and better if you can so Dow Corning made another one and they said here's one 10% stronger, 10% stiffer and they called it structural glass and that's why we call it S glass. Now, now we have thousands of different types of glass. Glass. Every glass manufacturer has their own code. There's a lot of high modulus glass being made now that's about half the stiffness of carbon fibre. It's about 30-40% stiffer than uh, normal e-glass. And um, you'll be able to uh, build boats out of that. Uh, there are a few people converting tow. I thought I had a bobbin but I don't. I gave it away. Um, uh, high modulus glass has been... Oh, has anybody got... Who has a smartphone? If you go away and look up Gorilla Glass, that's high modulus glass, that is incredibly strong. It's stronger than that piece of carbon fibre and um, it's made sort of the same way as uh, quite, quite incredible stuff that if you go away and, and look it up. Um, just remember Gorilla Glass. Um, so that's glass and glass is cheap because we just dig up sand and melt it. All the other fibres you've got to go to petrochemical product and get all sorts of weird chemicals together. So we move on to Kevlar, PBO, Dyneema, uh, uh, Vectran, Twiron, all those, all those sort of things. Made in a very similar way and um, you get all the chemicals together, you chuck it in a reactor, you let it drop through spinnerets and uh, it has a solvent and as it falls through vacuum the solvent flashes off and you grab it at a certain point when it gels and you put on a bobbin. And that's about, that's about it. And um, Kevlar, which was the first synthetic uh, fibre, was found accidentally, like a lot of stuff is, like stainless steel was found accidentally. Kevlar was found accidentally by a Polish lady chemist, um, was researching something and um, found this white muck in the bottom of a bowl one day that she didn't really understand and they, she decided to dry it and test it. It was these long strandy things and said, oh, we don't know what to do with it and put it aside and then 10 years later it was picked up and used to, as a steel replacement in tyres. Um, the two things to think about with structural fibres are crystalline types and non-crystalline types. Have people heard liquid crystal? Like that's a liquid crystal display. So there's things called um, Kevlar, PBO, uh, Twiron, Dyneema, uh, non-crystalline materials. Carbon, glass, um, PBO, they're crystalline materials. So the, the difference is that at the point of manufacture, when it drops through the spinneret, once it gels, if it's crystalline, you can't change it. So it's, it's a given object. And that, that becomes important when I talk about creep and relaxation. Um, if it's non-crystalline like Dyneema, it means that when it comes through and, and gels, it's, it's a random structure and you can muck with it. And so what happens is, um, this is actually a piece of Dyneema. This is uh, medium density polyethylene. And uh, in, when they make these strands, uh, the in internal is all random and it's not very stiff or strong. So they heat it up and they stretch it. So I suppose you've all carried your shopping and, and the bags get longer and longer and longer. That's called orientation and that will be, when we talk about rigging, that will become important. So all the, when you stretch it, all of the polymers, they're really long things, polymers, and they all start aligning up in the direction of stretch. And that's what makes it stiffer and stronger. 
So I'll just show a video on... Oh, fullerenes. I mean, fullerenes. So it's taken 60 years to get carbon fibre from point of invention to where we are today. Fullerenes were first commercialised about 30 years ago, so they, they're not even on the radar yet. We can make one millimetre long fullerenes at the moment. You can go and buy them. And um, they are continuous strands of carbon atoms, and they're flawless, and they're like 100 times stiffer, 100 times stronger than we have anything on the planet at the moment. And um, I'll show you uh, um, a bit more about fullerenes in the next slide. But I'm just going to show you a video on uh, carbon fibre drive shaft. And um, the thing to remember is that uh, they talk in um, champagne bottles, which doesn't really mean anything. So uh, a V8 supercar puts out 600 newton metres of torque and this tube breaks at 1300 newton metres, so it's twice as strong as a V8 supercar needs. I'm guessing that means you get to test things to do such So he had a bobbin like this. They call them cheeses, by the way. That's a little cheese. Uh, so any questions about that? About structural fibres? Okay. Hey, that um, old reel of carbon fibre, is that the same as the material you buy today? You can't buy T300 now. No. Um, you probably buy T, what's called T700, which is a bit better. Okay. China, Chinese are making T300, um, but it's um, they used to be called high strength. They used to be what's called high strength, and um, uh, they called it. Um, 
I uh, forget what they call it now, but they, they don't use that term anymore because they used to make carbon from coal pitch which, um, as well, which wasn't as strong. And then something made from what's called pan fibre or rayon is much higher strength and they called it high strength, but they don't have that distinction now. But I'll, I'll, I'll explain a little bit here. So I've looked at a few materials and I've put it on a graph and um, Gilligan ate something from the uh, village and got really strong and we've got a traditional material here called bamboo. So you generally sailors want the strongest, stiffest materials they can get. So um, the further up this, this left hand side here they get, the, the stronger it is the better. And the further we get out here on the right hand side the stiffer it is the better. And timber and aluminium and steel are down here. Our fibres are up here and um, so our T300 carbon was uh, released in 1960, so it's 56 years ago. Um, this might have had a date on it. It's in Japanese. But it's um, at least um, 25, 30 years old. Um, and um, the interesting thing, I talk about fullerenes and they are way up here. So the first fullerenes were made in 1980. Five, and they are um, way up here just off the planet and so and they're only 30 years into development so in the next 30 years you're going to see straight out of uh, Star Wars Star Trek type stuff being built that is pretty much indestructible and large scale super stiff like it's a thousand gigapascals so it's it's um, three four times stiffer than a good quality steel and ten times stronger. So it's, they're, they're amazing things, fullerenes. So that's just sort of a plot. And the um, PBO is up here. PBO is a really good material. Um, only negative is UV resistance, which we're going to talk about later on. So same stiffness, um, stronger than carbon fibre, same stiffness as carbon fibre. And it's um, about 60% uh, density. And the strongest uh, carbon fibre we can, commercial carbon fibre, there's a whole bunch of materials that we don't even know about that are in in military use that um, are just like fullerenes. I mean, they might be making things with fullerenes now that we don't know because they're just, uh, they won't tell us. But the, um, the, the highest strength um, commercial carbon fibre is up here, 6,000. It's called the Teeth 1000, made by Torre. It's an intermediate modulus, so it's about nearly twice as stiff as steel and it's uh, 6,000 megapascals, which puts it right up there. Um, Formula One love it, they, they consume a lot of it and the aircraft industry consumes a lot of it. Um, so any, any questions about that sort of group of materials? And so um, uh, hopefully we're all around in 30 years, we might see some fullerenes, some fullerene boats going around. So on to rigging. You now know what a crystalline and non-crystalline product is and in our crystalline lines of rigging you've got PBO, carbon, Vectran and steel. And the question is would you let Gilligan rig your boat? No? no? Okay. And in our no the most popular non-crystalline fibre is Dyneema or now called Dynice if people are up with it. Um, I spoke to the Dyneema, I spoke to the uh, Hamptonian rep, Australian rep today about um, UV and I asked him about, um, about about a year ago I noticed they changed from Dynice, from Dynex to Dynice and um, there's a company in America that's called Dynex and they rang them up a couple of years ago and said sorry it's our name we've been using it for 30 years and you've only been using it for 20 years so we win. So they had to change their name. So uh, with rigging fibres PBO is uh, probably the premium uh, material because it's the lightest, stro strongest and stiffest but it has um, a UV problem so they coat it, they cover it in a, sh in, a, in a plastic tube and unfortunately that plastic tube, once you add those two together you're sort of where, back to where a couple of the others are. But uh, super yachts where weight is really critical and things like that, they love PBO. Carbon's very popular, not affected by UV, very stiff, very strong, a bit tender if you uh, nick it and, and uh, uh, bump it, you can break them quite easily. Vectran um, is another crystalline product made just like spiderweb, um, developed again for the space race for space tethers and uh, used to hold um, Formula One and NASCAR wheels on when they, so they don't fly off and hit people in the crowd, all that sort of stuff. I like Vectran, um, 
and, but it's hard to get. It's easier to get uh, Dyneema or Humpy than uh, Vectran strand. So that, that, that there is uh, that blue, that's called Amsteel. That's the same stuff as uh, Dynex. Um, that's a 22 millimeter uh, cable. Size for size, Dynex is the same strength as steel. So if you've got a 20 mil, if that, that, if you've got a 22 millimeter stainless steel rod, uh, that's the same strength as it. Um, so I've, all, I've talked about um, entanglement. So when we make Dyneema or this sort of product, the polymers are all entangled. I've talked about orientation, and on a rig. A lot of people talk about creep. So have people used synthetic? Have people heard that term before? Have anybody been interested in rigging synthetics? And they, everybody says, oh, it creeps. Yeah, sure yeah, uh, yeah, you know, you've got spectra uh, yeah, running backstays and, uh, and whisker bowls, uh, whisker uh, uh, in uh, spectra as well. And uh, the rigger busted up pretty stresses before uh, we took off to Gladstone. Mm -hmm. Well, that's construction stretch. It's not creep, actually. So I'm going to explain a couple of things. So you've got construction stretch. So when you build a rig, when you put terminals on and everything else, all the threads, all the buckles, uh, if you grab that piece of cable and just pull it, you'll find it's got a little bit of give in it. Um, and that's called construction stretch. And that's what you're taking out when you pre-rig, when you pre-load a rig. So you, you, you tension it up, you go sailing, and it stretches, and everything beds down. And then eventually you come back and you tighten it all up again and it settles down and then it doesn't change. That's called construction stretch. Now creep, creep is when the polymers start sliding past each other. And to creep uh, polymers properly, you have to keep stretching it. So if you hang something in a tree and put a weight on it, um, that'll creep. So all the polymers start, at a certain load, all the polymers start slipping uh, past each other. That can't happen on a boat because you've got a fixed terminal length. So you can't actually creep a cable. So they, they're telling you the wrong thing. This is called relaxation. So what happens is um, with a non-crystalline product, they can't orient it 100%. So when they, stre when they stretch their, their plastic bag, they might be able to stretch it to 90% orientation. And then if you put a, a static load on it for a long time, that 10% left in it comes out, and that's called relaxation, and that's what's happening. With crystalline products, you can't relax it and you can't creep it because it's set in concrete. Its structure is set in concrete, so carbon doesn't creep, it doesn't relax, glass doesn't creep or relax, uh, and PBO doesn't creep or relax. Steel does creep um, if you load it high enough, so it's mainly um, construction stretch. So unfortunately with those sort of 12-strand uh, ropes, there's got quite a lot of uh, room in them. So this is called 12-strand, and um, it's really roomy. And that's the problem with it, that um, if you don't take out all of that room in it, then there's a lot of room left in it to move. But they will overcome that um, eventually with different uh, things, because uh, I think that is that sort of stuff is the future. That's going to overtake steel really rapidly. So, we got any questions about rigging, rigging fibres, or rigging? So you're saying that Vectran is going to overtake steel? Absolutely. Unless they, unless steel drops their price, Vectran, Dyneema especially. Dyneema is so cheap to make; it's dear to buy because it's sold as a premium product. But as soon as a bunch of people jump on and start competing and, and you can now buy it in China, it's just a rope and it's cheap. So so what about the, sorry, what about the UV? Okay, that's a very good question. UV, uh, because we're on, I was on Renaissance yesterday and um, we had a jib, a jib failure and it was due to UV eating the polyester stitching on the webbing. So. Um, I made a couple of inquiries today. Uh, there's what they claim. Where's my box? So Hamptigen, Hamptigen claim um, the ropes don't corrode and are not affected by sunshine and UV rays. So that's in writing. But I, I kind of think that's a big statement. Um, they're sending me their actual test data, and I'll send it through to Mike and to 
uh, Bruce when I get it. Um, uh, polymers are held together by hydrogen bonds and they're not really very strong and UV can knock out hydrogen bonds really easily. Uh, people get worried because they buy that sort of rope and it changes colour or uh, red or green and that's just a dye. And I think what will happen in future is for yachting, we'll, they'll introduce a dye that is time based so that when, it, when that rope goes clear, that's time to give it up, something like that. Or, or they'll coat them, they'll put them in PVC uh, which will die and you replace it or you can, put, you can buy a shrink tube and do it yourself um, if you're worried. But they haven't, they, we haven't really used them long enough to figure out a lifetime for ultra high density polyethylene product. So, resins. Yes? Some of the Corsairs are using them for um, uh, standing rigging for five years, five or six years, to my knowledge. I'd expect. I, I've never heard of anybody break them. Did anybody break them? No, I don't think it'll happen because they've been using them um, for shipping lines, for trawler lines, for holding ships up, for uh, logging work in Canada for 20 years. And, and they just don't, and they're out in the sun all the time. And uh, um, I don't think that you'll actually be able to fail. You'll, I mean, the outer fibres might get a bit um, daggy, but in terms of the uh, when we saw it, the other thing is that when we currently when you size a rig um, all the engineers like sizing it to equal rigid or equal stiffness to the steel one because that's what they're used to but that means you saw have your in terms of strength you're like five times stronger or something because you're at least half the stiffness so you, it's it's a silly equation really but once we learn to knock that down because that's where we come to it. When you size a steel rig, uh, it is sized first by strength, then you knock it down for fatigue, we've talked about fatigue, and you try to run it at 30% the braking strength. And that 30% comes from fatigue. And then they say, okay, we'll do a similar thing with this, we'll size it on strength, we'll knock it down to 30% so it won't creep. I've just told you it doesn't creep. So we've knocked it all down and at some point in time we're going to have to wake up and go, oh, instead of using a 20 mil cable, let's use a 6 mil cable. So right now the cable sizes are so big when you use Dynex that if the top 10% fell off by UV or was chewed off by a crow, you've got so much left in it. The other thing is if you, with, with folding trimer and Generally, what we do is we take the side stays and roll them up. Yeah. But that doesn't matter. No. Oh, that's steel or. No, I, well, we used to with steel, yes. But, but, but with the Dynex? The dyno, yeah, dyno. No, 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 no. That's. Uh, I've done really nasty things with Vectran and Dynema on my skiffs. And I've just tied them into shackles and stuff and given heaps, and that's, they're fine. The outside diameter. Otherwise, well, as the rope, the diameter of the rope on the inside oh. is less than the outside, so you actually got to have working between the layers. Mm. Well, the 12, um, if you, <coughs> um, the four wheel drive guys give it, them heaps on really small diameter winches around trees and shackles and everything, and they can't kill them. Well, I think it's the same. They, they, Hampton and um, the American company brands, what's the name, who do Spectra, they quote um, radiuses for bend radiuses and stuff, for, and fatigue cycles and stuff. And when you look at those numbers, um, yachties are well under those, but I think they'll, they'll just work. And I think they'll figure out construction. They'll change the construction of th this sort of 12 strands. I, I know a guy that works on That the factor. Distance is a lot than the inside distance. And some of the ropes they used actually welded. They, they come out stiff up. They went around the winch on the load. Yep. They turned into bars. Yeah, because they melt. They they melt and jam together. Yeah. That um, what you they should move to a PBO or a Vectran would have a lot being crystalline. They they. I believe there are some yeah. It'll, 
Yeah, if you get on to um, the, like Marlow and a couple of the higher tech, they have all sorts of blends for those sort of reasons. And they have outside sheathing, braiding, over braiding for all those things. And perhaps in the future, for those sort of applications, we might go to tape rather than rope because tape, we can, we can make tape and it'll go around something like that. So we're kind of a, it's a, it's a, technology is a funny thing because you develop something somewhere and it creates a problem. So you solve the problem built on that technology and we've been using winches for hundreds of years and they haven't really changed much. So um, perhaps that sort of, this sort of rope technology will force a change in a winch to, not a winch, but it'll be something else, like a caterpillar winch or some other thing, a puller, push puller or something like that, that they use on cable handling equipment. So this is all about heat? That heat, that? yes. So it's got intern, when it goes, if you've got a big diameter around a small, yeah, yeah when it, it shears internally, rubs together and it welds. And it will weld together. Dynex will, I forget the max temp on Dynema, on, but it's quite low, it's only 100, I think it's 120 degrees or something. But something like Vectran's 280 or 300 degrees, and PBO's even higher. So you, you jump to those if you've got a lot of internal friction. But then that's a lot more dollars. If you're on a super yacht, that doesn't seem to matter. <laughs> yes. Uh, okay. No, I think I missed something. I'll just go back here. Oh no, okay. Pan. So we're moving on to resins and um, the professor was always seen to get be able to do anything and um, make all sorts of things out of coconuts. This is a jet pack that washed up one day and he was making some fuel for it instead of uh, patching up the boat. And uh, a bit of, uh, do we have boat builders here or, fa or laminators, fabricators? No? Had a go at it. Has anybody used spray tack to hold things together with their, with their laminates, spray tack? No? Okay. Well, in 1964, updos were really big, big hair was really big, and the most popular beauty product was hairspray. And now they've gone out of, hairspray's gone out of fashion and everybody using spray tack in composites um, has taken that place. So um, polyester, vinyl ester and epoxy are the major resins in boat building and polyester is the cheapest. That's because it's the simplest and uh, cheapest to make. Uh, then you go up to vinyl esters which is an epoxy backbone with styrene crosslinks and then epoxy is pure epoxy. And um, polyesters are really brittle. They suffer from a thing called um, hydrolysis. So if you're in contact with water all the time, the water actually breaks down polyester and back to its uh, original acids. And if anybody's seen an osmosis blister and burst it and all that black crappy acid comes out, that's its uh, main constituents. So that, but on a structural level, the main difference with um, polyester, polyester five, uh, it has two bonds at the ends and it's a long polymer and it's straight and that's why it's really brittle because it's got no give in it so they, they all add together like that and um, epoxy is a horseshoe shape it has bonds on the end and it's actually a horseshoe in 3D so it comes around and does a funny loop like this and that's why it's so tough because when, when it gets pulled it's got somewhere to go and it's also strong because that entangles really well, so it all ties together, and uh, and um, so vinyl ester is cheap because we use a whole lot of styrene in it, and that's why it shrinks because we have excess styrene in it, and epoxy doesn't shrink because um, it combines uh, at a set ratio. Now the problem with all those resins is when they cure, they cure really well, and we want to when we want to bond something to it, it's really difficult. It may sound simple, but it's actually very difficult. And the aircraft industry and the automotive industry have stayed away from bonding composites. They bolt them up until recently. So the uh, adhesive people rushed away and for the last 10 years they've worked on urethanes and acrylics. 
and um, there's a whole bunch of urethane and acrylic glues now that bond composites really well. And in fact, the um, oh, where's that? Did I pass that around? Is the where's the box of stuff going around? Is it around yet? Yeah. Keep passing that around. Um, mm -hmm. This uh, sailcloth. They join this together with uh, an, an acrylic resin. Oh, this is dying. This is uh, aging. In right in front of us. That's probably. That's probably. Uh, I bought that in um, a shop up in far north Queensland, probably 25 years ago. Now it's dying. Plastic. You can't trust it. Um, this is a piece of black. The main sh main sail of blackjack. And if you want to repair it. You use a, a, a urethane adhesive, so you give it a wipe down with acetone, you get another piece of that, stick on top of it, and use a Loctite urethane. Um, and they're, they're really good. So there's a big chunk of nylon over there, that's typical for bushes and things like that. And thermoplastics are coming in, so the aircraft industry and the car industry are uh, getting into thermoplastics big time. So this is um, high density polyethylene, which is the same as that stuff. This is not oriented though. Uh, do we have any plumbers here? No? Has anybody been in Bunnings and bought a piece of PVC and seen PVC O? Yeah. That means oriented. So now you'd be able to tell the Bunnings guy what the O means. That's, so when it goes through the extruder, it gets oriented and it's stronger in that direction than the hoop direction. So this is uh, high density polyethylene, number two. So that is the same stuff as that, except that's highly oriented and this is not oriented. And um, you can melt that and add it to fiberglass and you get a really good product. And that's what they do. So instead of uh, aircraft industry and car industry relying on um, thermoset resins, such as epoxy, which work at ambient temperature, they uh, melt this sort of material, or PET. And uh, PET is a... Uh, polyethylene therophate, really good product. I'll mention that when we get to sales. Uh, or a product like that, you melt it. You get a dye with fiberglass or carbon fibre in it, close it, and under high pressure squish this stuff in, and you get a if Has anybody tried to destroy one of those? This is really hard to destroy. Yeah. Uh, so when you make a car part, that's what they want, and that's what they're doing. They're using those sort of resins. So that's a bit of trivia. Uh, I won't talk about surface energy, that's getting a bit complicated. I've talked about adhesion. Now adhesion, adhesion depends on um, all those little defects in the surface in metals, all those grain boundaries. Your glue has to flow across the surfaces in and into them to actually adhere. And that's, that's what adhesion is. And if it doesn't flow into those little cracks, and the same as cracks in a laminate, this laminate, if you looked at it under a microscope, is probably full of little surface cracks. And that's when you're when you're adhering something, that's what you're doing. You're, you're keying those two things together at a microscopic level, level. Any more questions on resins? No? Okay. Um, sale materials. Uh, in the late 40s, we're still having cotton sales. And Ted Hood said, there's got to be a better way. And um, did a whole bunch of research and found a uh, product called Dacron, which we all know t today. But he couldn't get anybody to make a sail for him because a sail has to be really tight weave so that the air can't get through it from one side to the other. Nobody wanted to make a high denier, stiff, preset cloth for him. So he, he bought a mill and he did it himself. The rest is history, as they say. So that was 1952. So uh, who's got a polyester shirt on? or polyester blend. That's it. That's polyethylene therophate. And uh, there's a lot of companies that take these and turn them back into shirts and jumpers and stuff. Polyethylene therophate's a really great product. It's also called Mylar. Who's heard of Mylar? Mylar, PET, same stuff. Uh, there's a couple other names around used in the sailing industry, but it's all that stuff. So, what um, what happened though, uh, he made a really nice sail, but air could still get through it. So they said, oh, we better fill up the holes with something. So who's, who's seen that sort of stuff on their furniture? W white melamine. 
well that's what that's why your sail is white and crinkly because it's full of that stuff. Melamine is cheap, UV resistant and easy to process and uh, heat resistant. So that's why it's crinkly because melamine is quite a brittle material. So over time it gets crinkly and uh, cracks and softens out, lets the air through so it doesn't uh, behave as well and it loses stiffness. And there are companies in the States and Singapore who will take your old sail vacuum clean it, strip the resin off, put more resin in, send your sail back, it looks like new. So that's, that's going to happen more and more. Now we can make sails out of nearly anything, PVO, Dyneema, um, we started off with weaves, carbon fibre weaves. Oh, here's some um, pre-preg, pass that around. That's some pre-preg, we'll get to that soon. Anything else? No. Okay. So um, you can make sails, what we want with sails is something that holds its shape uh, and um, yeah, send one one way and get one the other way. Uh, that's a pre-preg. Uh, there's some brochures over there from Lavender and North Sales, and there's one here for uh, a uh, triangle. Um, so the stiffer the material, the better. And now we're making 100% carbon fibre sails, such as this, this one, which has no, if you feel that, that is just a board. And actually, um, there's no difference to that to a carbon fibre laminate such as this. So this, this and this are the same thing, they're just thinner, or this, carbon fibre product. So the, the glues used in the sails, are very, because it's thin you can bend it. So if you had a piece of uh, alfoil for instance, you can bend alfoil really easily, but if it was two or three millimetres thick you can't. So sails, so, so the history of sails is we had wovens, we went to laminates, so here's a piece of uh, mylar. You may not know that, but there's a piece of mylar. And, um, and uh, they have a machine that holds this sort of stuff and they zing it all around the surface where they want it. Then they get another piece of mylar and they stick it on the top. And now you've got a string sail. So that's how string sails are made. So uh, you can use anything in a string sail. And, and the, the, the weakest link of a string sail is the adhesive because it's UV affected and it'll eventually let you down. So they've got big machines uh, that um, have uh, hundreds of these uh, with dynema or carbon fibre or whatever. And um, they have a called a creel and it lays it down and it goes all over the surface sticking it down like that and it goes into a vacuum bag and they set it into shape or they make that flat and then they use that uh, as a pattern sail rather than a moulded sail. So moving along, so um, on Gilligan's Island the professor made uh, a ginger of, uh, of machine here that looks just like a, uh, a sail maker's machine. <laughs> And, um, oops, sorry, what happened there? Don't know why that happened. Push too many buttons. And uh, they tried to get off the, off the island a couple of times and they, they had made sails out of something here and a traditional material bamboo. So, the, yeah, the sails went from wovens to laminates, then they went to string sails. And that was built on um, um, laminates came about because we suddenly could make big sheets of plastic like this this, this is uh, actually an or all the plastic you buy is oriented. Now you know the word. It's called biaxial oriented because all plastic sheets like that are made in a big machine like a balloon and they uh, push molten plastic through a hole with air pressure and it blows out into a big balloon and then it cools and they collect it in a big tube and then they slice it up. And this is actually a tube. So this tube would have come out of the machine and, and they would have stopped blowing it up at that big. So it's actually biaxially, called biaxially oriented. And um, because we could get really big sheets of mylar, then somebody said we can now make sails out of this sort of stuff. And that's where the string sails come from. And then after the string sails came along, they said, well, let's, let's just move along and use all the broadloom stuff like carbon fibre and glass and other stuff that people were weaving and put resin in it and forget about the laminate and you end up here. 
So that, that comes as a prepreg, so it looks just like the prepreg that's going around. It's a tape about that wide. It's fifth, this is, um, I don't know what this is, they, they don't, wouldn't tell me at North what that weighs. But um, the prepreg going around is 600 gram, I think, because I've got 600 gram on a 700. Uh, 600 gram, this is made of 50 gram layers. So a typical uh, cruising yacht, I think, uh, are you a sail maker? No? Um, uh, I think one of, one of the typical Dacron cruising sails are 400 gram. Does anybody know that? 400 or 800 gram? Does that ring a bell with anybody? No? So, sorry? Distant past. Distant past. Um, so you need, um, if it was 400 gram, you need eight layers uh, to get to this. I, I meant to weigh this and figure it out, but I didn't. I ran out of time. Uh, so that's kind of the future. There's uh, more stuff like that. Uh, unless we uh, get a, um, a plastic or something that is really stiff uh, that we can just do in one hit and go back to pattern sales. Why would you um, want a really stiff plastic for your sail, given the fact that you've got to have a pull down? That's the limiting factor. So you want a material that is stiff enough that stays shape, <coughs> but will flake and uh, that you can handle. So that's, that's the limiting factor. But if, if it was a piece of aluminium that held shape, uh, it would be better than sailcloth. But how do you tack it and how do you pull it down? And that's the debate when you go to wing sails because you can't pull them down. And they're twice as efficient, but you can't flake them and you can't pack them up and you can't pull them down. Well, I'm actually fact they're developing from the America's Cup wing sails that do draw. There are people. Yeah, that's there's how I've got a, a, a cruising yacht now with one. Yeah, other. yeah, there's people working on that, but they, they won't be as efficient as solid. But there are, you know, there are people working on that problem. So that's that discussion is for another day. And the only the only problem with sails is UV degradation. But if you go to something like that with, um, and again, North Australia don't know what resin that is. They don't know. They say don't they don't know and they don't care. They just make sails. Um, uh, my guess it's a urethane and because uh, uh, it's quite um, uh, not brittle although you can get epoxies that uh, will bend like that quite nicely so it depends on um, uh, it may be published and uh, there are people I've seen people make um, get carbon fibre cloth and put urethane in it to make uh, um, hardware bags, daggerboard bags and stuff like that. It looks really good. That would probably make a really good sale. Um, so any, any questions about sales? And if there's any questions off materials about other stuff that I've talked about before, just ask. I don't mind being off topic. One of the big problems always is delamination of the high-tech sales. Yes. Uh, this material, what's it you call that? Uh, they call it 3DI. 3DI. That's still a laminate, isn't it? Still. Well, the question is, is it a laminate? Because that the resin is right through. So it's not technically, it's a, technically a laminate, but that resin is holding everything th called through thickness. So in our laminate here, um, I can pull that apart if I can find the end. And that's what happens when you're talking about delaminates. But you can't pull that apart. That sun kills that off, doesn't it? No, they say it doesn't. So <laughs> <laughs> they say, you know, they've they've had them on the Volvos. They've been around two or three times, and uh, all the rest, and they don't. They're fine. So they do supply. This is called raw. It doesn't have a scrim on it, and they and the the cruising one has a a light scrim of something on both sides for that reason. But they say the raw one is fine. So away you go. So. You still can't fold it, you still can't put it in a sail bag, shovel it anyway, kick it and push it to where you want it to be. Yeah, you can. Apparently you can, yeah. Oh, really? That's what they say. So. No. no. <laughs> <laughs> um, <laughs> Um, give that one a hard time and see what happens. Sorry? Oh, give that one a hard time and I mean, it's, uh, it's see what see what happens. Um, any more sale questions?
<laughs> you can paint it. They, they paint it. Oh, by the way, uh, on the synthetic resin things, if, if anybody is using synthetic resins, uh, synthetic cable and they're worried about UV, buy house paint, good quality house paint, dilute it 50-50 with water and just paint it. And they, they guarantee their paint, Gilux guarantee their paint for 10 years and one of them they guarantee for 20 years. And that's specifically developed, that's an acrylic resin, won't, and it's a water base, it won't attack your thing, but it's got super duper UV protection in it and if you um, dilute it, it'll seep into your cable and two coats and you should be right forever. Sorry? If you're worried about your cables, if you've got synthetic cable and you're worried about it, paint it with house paint, good quality house paint, but dilute it so it sinks in. Yeah. Works fine. It's great. It's great. It's great material. So we're near the end. Uh, processes. <coughs> Casting, welding and brazing, laminating, bonding or bondage. Actually, when I was looking through uh, all the images for suitable images, there was a lot of people tied up. Um, I don't quite know. It must have been popular in the 60s. So um, just to cover this image up here, this is a, a, a micro section of a crack at a weld toe. Do, do we have any welders here? Anybody who has welded? And when you weld something, did you find that it all distorted? That's because when, molten, when metals goes from, from liquidus to solidus, it shrinks 2%. So it generates a huge amount of strain in the structure. And what it does at the weld toe, um, it has to end at one of those uh, inner granular boundaries that I talked about. And it shrinks and it pulls that open. And that's the beginning of the crack. So when you weld something, you actually weld uh, full of cracks. You really do do, do a bad job. Um, I used to make, um, 20 years ago, I used to make bike frames, like this one. And um, uh, we had to sell frames into Europe, and we had to pass an endurance test. And uh, when we, um, our braised steel frames passed the test, our welded steel frames failed, our aluminium welded frames passed, and our aluminium welds dressed, which is this one, mechanically dressed, did really well. And that's because when you dress a weld, you remove that crack, that beginning crack at the toe. So if you're going to, my recommendation is don't weld anything, do it in composite. But if you do have to weld something, dress the weld mechanically. And if you're TIG welding, TIG, it's called TIG dressing if you look it up, you can re-melt the toe and blend that toe out and get rid of those cracks that will start somewhere. So casting is a really simple process. This is more or less a casting. It's a mould. You make a cavity that's the right shape. You melt your plastic or your metal and you pour it into it and um, you get your product. Welding and brazing. Uh, welding, you melt, melt the parent metal together with a rod and, and there's a weldment over there and we're all familiar with welded stuff. And um, my recommendation is don't weld anything. And I like brazing. There's a brazing sample in the box and there's a brazing sample over here of aluminium. So um, um, I've, I braze that together and uh, the big, there's a big chunk over there. And when you braze something, you don't melt it. You actually uh, use something that has a melting temperature less. So there, that's brazed together. You can, you can braze titanium, stainless steel, steel, any of the metals with various metals. And, um, if we, and, and um, what happens when you braze it is that the molten material flows into all those little cre crevices rather than opening them up and so you get a much uh, stronger and better fatigue performance joint. Then we move on to laminating. You called uh, open laminating or contact laminating as we get um, some carbon fibre or some glass, some resin in a bucket, and you put it on the mould, you pour the resin on and you roll it around. That's manual laminating or, or contact laminating, and you end up with a product that we call it... Um, uh, we call it glass reinforced plastic, but it should be called um, um, plastic with a little bit of fibre in it because when you open mould things, you can't actually add much fibre to it. So typically, um, you've only got about 20, 15 or 20 per cent fibre in it by volume. To improve that, they invented the, um, the vacuum bag, and the vacuum bag was invented in uh, World War II for holding plywood together while they hot set it, making um, it was first used on pilot seats. Fibre, uh, Plywood fiber, um, plywood 
pilot seats in aircraft, and then it used, got used. Uh, we even made boats like it, um, and then it extended into composites. So you uh, lay up a wet bag, you put a breather on it, you put a vacuum bag over it, and you squeeze out the resin so you get more fibre in it. The more fibre in it, the better. These days we do dry bags where we get um, a dry stack of fiberglass. So this was made um, for Andrew. I made this for Andrew Stransky in, as a gudgeon. I um, stacked all that fiberglass up dry, then put a vacuum bag on it, and then used that vacuum to draw resin in and fill it up. And makes a very high quality laminate. And uh, uh, that has 55% um, by volume uh, uh, glass in it, and it probably only has about 25% by weight resin. So if you're an open laminator, you used to, uh, uh, with chop strand mount or something, you're adding two and a half, two times the amount of resin to, two kilos of resin to one kilogram of glass. That's got um, 250 grams of resin in it to one kilogram of glass. So it's a really strong product. Uh, bonding, uh, talk a little bit about bonding. Um, follow the manufacturer's recommendations, use a tough bond and uh, the state of the art for bonding, preparation, preparation, preparation for bonding things and a um, thing called flame, flame or plasma preparation is the preferred method in aerospace and, and car construction these days. Haven't seen many uh, people in the marine industry use it, I've talked to a few people to do it. If anybody wants to know about it can ask in, in the official question time. And then, has anybody got a 3D printer at home? No? Has anybody seen a 3D printer? The hell did you get on for sale at the moment? I did that. OK. So commercially, you can buy a 3D printer for about $600. I'm not really interested in little plastic trinkets that those things make. <laughs> but there's a lot of people in, um, there's a company in Melbourne, company, several companies in, in America and, and Europe that make metal printers. So this is a bicycle in, made in Melbourne. Um, it's titanium lugged and uh, carbon fibre frames, and these have been 3D printed. So next time you may have a, like the gudgeon or another part, instead of uh, casting it, where's Jim? Oh, instead of making it a bronze, ring me up and we'll have a titanium one printed. So the beauty of uh, printing metal parts is uh, if you want to make um, a metal thing, if you want to make that out of metal in one piece, you have to buy a block of metal bigger than it and mill it all away and you end up with a lot of swarf on the floor really expensive, especially if that was titanium. Um, with printing, you, end, you start with uh, titanium dust or stainless steel dust. You get a laser to, m to melt it and you make the part exactly the way you want it. And then the dust you don't use, you put in the next one. So you only use the dust that you use. So this is what it looks like when it comes out, this particular frame, when it comes out of the box. And you can see it's got full of little ribs and details and various things. And you can do impossible things uh, with it. So for instance, um, if we made that gudgeon out of titanium, the inside of that gudgeon we could make as a honeycomb and we'd only have a solid skin. So it'd be half the weight of what if we cast it in, or aluminium, if we did an aluminium, um, whatever it weighed, it'd be half the weight. So th there are things now certified and flying. Boeing and Airbus have a whole bunch of things um, that are printed and flying. And this is something that's going to happen more in the future. So if that works, it's a powder you put in there in the first place, I think. Yes. How does it bond together? It's laser melted. So it works exactly like a, like a photocopier. You know how? Instant. It's instant. Um, you know how uh, a laser photocopier works with the toner? Yeah. So the toner is polyester, this stuff. The world loves this stuff. Everything's made out of it. Um, so your toner in it, black toner is black, <coughs> black polyester. And um, uh, forget about the electrostatic bit that attracts it, but uh, up on the drum is its melting point and the uh, toner gets attracted to that point and then melts on the paper. That's why it comes out hot. So what happens is um, you have a tray of uh, aluminium dust and a wiper comes across and squ squares it off uh, and then the laser melts that layer and then they, a wiper comes across and adds 0.1 millimetres of more dust and then melts the next layer and it just builds it up. That's called laser sintering. And, uh, and the metal, uh, I checked in on it probably five or six years ago and it was pretty cruddy, the results. But I've checked in on printers uh, a year ago and the printed material is better than wrought 
material, stainless steel, titanium, aluminium. So whatever grade you use, uh, the material is, it's fine. So it's a really good process. And the, this is gonna happen more and more. Um, on your previous yep. Well, bonding is usually uh, some sort of adhesive. If it's a welding process, it's a welding process. Yeah, well, I, I can't remember what they're called. There's quite a number of products that are, that are available. TJ Weld, I think there was one I purchased recently at J-Car uh, to fill some minor water uh, scourings out of a block. Oh, you're talking about, yeah, some, some companies, Loctite, have a weld line and it's a metal. It's a metal filled epoxy. Yeah, Is it for? F it's for filling. Sorry. Yeah, you can buy um, epoxy with uh, iron, aluminium, um, steel, powder in it. It's nearly. So that's not this sort of stuff. No, they're usually used for fillers, um, for different jobs or for heat transfer. A lot of tooling's made with high uh, epoxy with a lot of aluminium in it, so it, it transfers heat through it. But it, but it still has to. Mm -hmm. fixed yeah, we can use it. it yeah, well, it's generally an epoxy. And then he took out a sledgehammer and couldn't. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so it is good, yeah, they're good. And they're, they're, those sort of products are usually epoxy because they don't shrink. If you use, it, if you use um, um, other things with a solvent in it, uh, when it shrinks, it generates a lot of stress in the bond line and they can fall off. So the epoxies are really good. For, um, because they don't shrink, for that reason. Do they make those sorts of epoxies that have electrical conductivity? Do you use the joint Uh Yeah, if you get on to... Um, so they're really expensive because they... they burial to a stage or something? Yeah, you can get them with gold, in, gold in them and silver in them. Um, if you get on to... Um, uh, what's it called? Um, one of the, uh, like, RA supplies. They have conducting epoxy. You just buy it. Now, any uh, any other questions there? Just one question, Peter, in regard to the uh, welding of stainless steel. Yep. Um, I was always taught that if you start welding normal three point six stainless, <coughs> you can get a problem with it cracking alongside. The, the welding point of fact doesn't actually crack on the weld; it cracks alongside, which is called into the into crystallized corrosion. Apparently, if you put uh, titanium in it or something like that, it doesn't do it. Can you roughly explain that? <laughs> Why? Yes. Uh, roughly is um, titanium is usually added to metals. It's called a cedar. So when you have molten metal, um, uh, molten metal, you can imagine a molten, me um, molten metal chunk. And um, if we look at this image here, you can sort of see the grains. So um, what happens is um, if, it, if it starts crystallising randomly, uh, you'll get really long weird grains and it'll, it, it actually, a weld shrinks. Uh, all the grains are long fibre things and it has a lot of strain. If you add titanium or uh, scandium or a couple of other things to it, they seed the weld. So uh, instead of randomly crystallizing, it'll crystallize in a whole bunch of spots. It, that starts as a seed and it starts and makes nice spherical grains. And so the shrinkage is controlled a lot better. Thank you. Thank you. So, and we used um, scandium for a similar reason. We used scandium, we imported scandium rods on some of our bike frames and that, that helped with the fatigue results. Any other questions on metals? There's a thing called uh, hot, hot cracking with welds and cold cracking. And hot cracking is the shrink, shrinkage problem, which you're talking about. Cold cracking is um, that the, the alloy and the mixture is a thing called um, uh, the melt ratio between the parent metal and the weldment. 
and um, you get a weird alloy because you've, the weld rod you're using is usually not the same as the parent. And a day or two later, that alloying decides to, to do something. It precipitates or does weird things and it'll crack. So you've got to wait for a couple of days. Like they, they do x-ray tests on, on gas lines and things like that two days or four days or five days after it's welded because you, have, you can get cold cracks. And there were some water tanks we were doing years ago that uh, you couldn't use normal 316 because uh, even 316 alloy or 316 TI because they used it would crack but because these were high temperature tanks they were hot water tanks in a, mm -hmm. in a, in a, a big um, brick kiln <coughs> so we had to use excuse me <coughs> we had to use um, sanding material which killed the problem mm -hmm. yeah they add molybdenum usually to that so there's another hardener, or uh, molybdenum does odd things. Um, any other questions? No? So last, or nearly last, uh, here's a foil test. So here's the G4 that's for sale, actually. I think they've only made one. And um, it weighs four and a half tonne. And this test puts 4.7 tonne on the dagger foil. And... Um, Oh, I sped up the last, um, what's his name, the drive shaft one because it's a bit long if I didn't run it fast. So this one's sped up too. So you can see that um, they're simulating the, the uh, dead weight load of the boat. And we're at just past two tonne. Now at three tonne. So it's deflecting about 500 millimetres now. And we're at 4.4 tonnes, so we're at the weight of the boat. And we get up to 4.7, 4.6 we get to, then they, then they back it off. And this is typically done now for a lot of components. So if you, since um, Andrew Simpson died in the America's Cup, uh, when you build your America's Cup boat, you have to supply the uh, primary design cases of, of the platform and the dagger foils and the rudders. You have to have them tested and certified and hand in a statutory declaration to the America's Cup authority that these are true and correct. And uh, this will sort of happen more and more. Um, boating industry has not, historically hasn't done much testing in, with their stuff and a lot of accidents have happened uh, and in general industry and in aircraft, if you have an accident, you have to investigate it, figure out what happened and tell everybody about it. And the marine industry has historically had accidents and things and basically buried it and not shared the information because they're a bit scared of things, I suppose. But I think that's got to change. So um, we'll see a lot more things tested in the future. So now we're um, officially in uh, question time and uh, they're all we're here wearing nice um, polyester bright clothing which could be turned into carbon fibre. So any more questions? Peter, I asked a question earlier about that roll of carbon fibre, the old, old one, full of old. Yeah. The one you buy today, is that exactly the same as that or have they improved the quality? Uh, oh, the quality is probably the same, but the specifications are different. So a typical, um, this T300, has a, has a strain of failure, um, T, T300, of one and a half percent. So if, 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 you, uh, if it was 100 millimetres long, if I get a piece of that 100 millimetres long and stretch it to 101.5, it'll break. Um, typically now we're using T700 and it's got 2.2 percent. So they've got better, they've got, they've got stretchier. Uh, and the higher modulus ones used to be like half a percent strain and then up to one, one and a half percent strain. So that's, and um, the way they make car, I haven't explained that. I don't know what the time is. What is the time? Um, do I keep talking? Do you want to know how, do you want to know how carbon fibre is made? So, okay, so carbon fibre starts as um, rayon or what's, this is made from a, uh, a fibre called pan. Uh, pan uh, polyacryl nitrile 
because it's got a high initial carbon content. So um, somebody in Japan, Japan makes really nice precursor product. Um, there's not many mills that can make um, 10 micron uh, fibres or 15 micron. So what's, and that's the other thing that's happened. Um, T300 is about um, 12 or 15 micron diameter and modern fibres are smaller. They're down to eight, 7, 8 micron. And I'll explain why that's, that's the case. So um, you start with... Um, um, if you so if somebody's got a polyester shirt on and you pull a strand out, that's your starting point, and that's about 90% carbon. And you put it in a, a high temperature oven, and uh, you first you cook it, uh, and then you stretch it a little bit. Then you put methane into it or a similar gas that has lots of carbon in it at the right temperature and pressure, and all the holes left, all the holes in that fibre start getting filled in with carbon. It's called carbonising, and then they stretch it a little bit more, and so. It's really interesting because carbon looks like a tree if you look under it. So it, it's a fibre like this, but it has rings this way. And then when the methane comes along, it fills all these gaps in. And it's these long ones here in between these rings that gives it its stiffness. And the way that they uh, make stiffer fibres is they make the diameter smaller and these uh, sort of get further apart and you get more long long carbon chains in it than the ones that go across it. So if you cut a carbon fibre fibre, it looks like a, it, it has radial rings and rings like this. It just looks like a tree. Yeah, pretty much. And so um, over time, they figured out, um, it's the same as glass. High modulus glass is made by making the fibre smaller, which means the uh, orientation of the crystals are more along the fibre the smaller you make it, they can't go sideways, they've got to go long ways. So it's the same with carbon, so if they make, as the fibres get smaller and smaller, um, it stacks longitudinally, and that's what's happened over the years. So, um, uh, and it's a really expensive process uh, because it's very energy intense and chemical intense. And, that's, and the other thing that drives carbon fibre cost is um, it's made for aerospace. All of the carbon fibre producers make aerospace grade carbon. There's only one company, Zoltec, that makes commercial grade and it's owned by BMW and BMW buys everything that they make. Because if you're a carbon fibre maker you make, if you, and you can sell it for $100 a kilo to aerospace, you're silly to make at an industrial level and sell it as $50 a kilo. Because every, every kilo of carbon fibre that's made on the planet is sold. And Torre and Sika in Europe, they're all doubling capacity in the next five years because Airbus, uh, Airbus and Boeing are going big time into carbon, and, but it's all aerospace grade, so the price is only going to go up. It won't come down. So there are comp BMW have bought companies. There's, a comp there's a, an association in Melbourne called Nexus that are trying to make cheap carbon. And it all comes down to what's called the precursor fibre, the fibre cost. And it might come back to rayon, because rayon's a renewable product, it's cellulose. So it might be sensible to use rayon rather than use uh, textron oil uh, to do that. So I think there's a, since I, I've been involved with carbon for since um, 1989 or something, and um, there's always talk about low cost carbon, but nobody's done it yet. But I think it will come because uh, it's sort of burst. It's bigger than just aircraft and cars now, I think. Might, might not be my lifetime. Yep? So we're all sailors here. We're hanging around out in the sun. Yep. And we've got this body great big ozone hole up in the world of the air, which is basically caused by chloro fluorocarbons. Yep. Yep. Are all these things that you're talking about going to, where's all the carbon coming from? Is it, is it coming from in the air or is <laughs> it's it coming oil. from all these It's, it's coming from oil. Metals, it's coming from oil. Coming from oil. Yes. In the ground. Yeah. And hopefully we're being sensible and we're building stuff uh, that's sustainable. Because once we convert the oil into something like that, um, and then chuck it in landfill, uh, I think we've done the wrong thing. So um, hopefully one day we either dig up landfill or we start converting this into other stuff. 
And like we, hopefully we're using oil to build things like windmills and other renewable stuff that's valuable into the future rather than this label and this that goes into the bin. And this gets recycled. I'm not sure in Australia how good our recycling system is. I tried to find that out once and um, I couldn't find where our recycling goes. It goes to various spots. But like, you know, there's nobody, you can't get a document that says that goes to somewhere, gets churned up and made into jumpers or... It's, it's, a, it's a difficult trail to find. To, to, it, We're smarter than that. We should be able to separate it. So we're, we're pretty clever. If we can make if we can make all this stuff, we can make a separator. So just, just before you leave, um, as with that G4, it's up to sale in um, four weeks' time in the states. It'll go for about four or five hundred thousand. Looking for parts. Be a cash in the pocket for your friends that want to move into that racing scenario. Moving on from that, uh, we're currently investigating a, a new trimaran. It's called an L45. Because the hull actually covers the three holes. Now, just bear with me for a minute. So basically you walk in, all on one level, heads and all the rest of it, and you've got a big section down the centre of the hole, and of course you know all the benefits of a trimaran and having inserts from one another. Now we're against a mongrel. Nell actually made a racing version just recently that did the transatlantic race, the ARC race, and it won it by many hours. Um, it was a lightweight version of it, and as you can see from the angle of the wheel, and that's the actual boat, that's the configuration of it. And we've been putting some numbers in, the OMR rating, comparing it to the others, basically just on weight, sale area, not the refinements. The first configuration is as it, as it is at the moment, with a uh, weight net weight of about six and a half ton, uh, 50, 60 square metres main, 150 square metres pinker, comes out at about 7.6, and if we up the head saw to about a 45 square metre as against the 25 self tacker, it goes times to 8.1. So we think it's going to be comparable to, in racing, to Renaissance, and we actually think with some modern developments which we've developed in the American stuff, challenge, then we'll be able to point three or four degrees higher and uh, get up to the uh, the uh, Fantasias or even the uh, Chilkills. Again, this particular boat sitting in the Miami. It's just finished the, the transatlantic race. I'm hoping to get the control of it and take it to Antigua Week and then bring it across to Australia to do that all the and all the other And again, we're looking for partners of 100,000 apiece. Basically, do the racing and then use it for cruising when you're not racing. Mike, Mike's thinking of buying it because it's a big model on my level that doesn't go down between the hull. If it goes fast enough. So anyhow, that's... Uh, and then we just some other things. If you're cruising, I don't know, but this parasail seems to be taking off in quite a dramatic way. Um, basically, when you jive, you just these sheets. They did, that was in 2014 on Fontaine Peugeot. It won again. It won the transatlantic race. And uh, that's on a 59 foot katana. I did the last race with them up at Hamilton Island and we got third. And that's a big heavy boat in compared to. Uh, uh, where's, the little, where's the little boat over there that's gone from OMR to uh, cruising? Excuse me, would you like to stand up? The cruising man there? What? Would you like to stand up as the cruising man now? He's gone from OMR to cruising, and of course he's winning all the cruising races. Uh. <laughs> Yeah. I don't understand that. So anyhow, there's some, just some and new that developments catch in. Us anyway. Sorry? I said that couldn't catch us. No, no, no. <laughs> well, difference in one. But that's just some cruising 
the racing stuff that's happening in the open world at the moment. So have you got any friends that want to move into that phenomena? I thought I'd bring it up to date with Thanks for your time. Well, Peter, again, you put on a stunning display. Uh, some of those things we've seen before, but uh, there's a lot of things we've forgotten too. Mm -hmm. And uh, again, I'm not as old as you, though, that brother Dud. <laughs> but then, no one is. <laughs> <laughs> But anyway, uh, the first thing that happened was I picked up this. Well, this is aluminium, was not it? It's just. It's, so only a, it's a tiny frame. It's, yeah, but it's, uh, it's just so amazingly light. Uh, and uh, yeah, we're all well, not all of us. Some of us in the are in the game of trying to make boats go faster and uh, learning all the tricks. And I think there's actually uh, you've opened our eyes in in quite a few areas. And so. Uh, I think we've all enjoyed it, team. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, well, oh. but there's more. There's more. Oh, thank you. A fine bottle. I'll even I'll even help you drink it, Dave. Just as, uh, <laughs> well, thank you very much. <laughs>